That's not possible for those people that want to know you. So we're grateful for that. Father, for this day, for the opportunity just to come and have you just uh, be a part of what you'd want us to be a part of this morning. And with all things that are taking place here this morning, may we hear your word and hear it clearly, Father. Lord, again, grateful for the opportunity to be in your house collectively as a group and that we can worship together. Thank you, Father. We pray that in the name this morning. Amen. Would you turn and greet somebody this morning, please? Good morning, Father. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, young man. How are you? Great. How are you? Good. Hi, Robbie. Good morning. Good morning. Please stand, we'll get back into our music this morning.
and she'll only have to serve probation. She won't have to serve any Pretty incarceration. Good. Any other praises today? Pardon me. <laughs> a, mixed, a mixed praise there. <laughs> Just a bountiful, bountiful, bountiful crop. Unbelievable. Bountiful crop, yes. We just prayer, prayer that, uh, that we can get to the hospital and nobody gets a fire going and everybody can stay safe. Okay. Have you ever seen a crop this good before? Never. Never. In my 40 some years ago, I've never seen a crop this good. Great blessing. Any other praises? Prayer requests. What do we have for prayer requests? I've got three that we we uh, talked about in Sunday school. Roger works had some hip surgery and and he's having some problems with it. He's going to have to see some specialists about what he can do to alleviate pain that he's having in that hip that he's had replaced. So be praying for Roger works. Um, Don C. Graves. I don't know. If, uh, if you'd seen it on, on uh, Facebook or wherever it was at, that Don Seagraves had had a couple of seizures and pray that uh, he could find out what is going on with that, that that might, that might be alleviated too, that he might be able to figure out what's causing that, that that might be alleviated also. And also, uh, Tyler Porter, uh, Floyd's brother, is dealing with uh, cancer, throat cancer. And he's about halfway through his treatments. He's lost quite a few pounds. And so if you could be in prayer for Tyler, how many more weeks of treatment? Uh, he's three. He's been there about, he has been seven weeks. He's been there about half the time. Okay, so he's still about halfway through, about another three weeks of treatment that he's been through. He's having a hard time swallowing. So um, if you could just be praying for him that he might get through this treatment and it might be successful. Are there any other prayer requests? Tony. I have one here. Um, yesterday, Bill Meeks from Geraldine was killed in a four-wheeler accident. So prayers for his family. Bill Meeks was killed in a four-wheeler accident yesterday. Mm 
Any other prayer requests? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we are thankful that you have blessed us with health enough to come into your house and to worship you. And Lord, as we look around in our county and we see the bounty, we see how you have blessed the farmers in this area, we're so thankful. Lord, we just pray that as they continue to bring in that bounty, that you might grant them safety, give them safety in the fields. We also pray that you might keep the fires from happening. We know that when temperatures get really hot, that the chance of fire really increases. And I just pray for safety. I pray that you might give us a blessing of no fires. But if we do have a fire, that they might be extinguished quickly. Lord, we have several people who are on our on our prayer list. Roger Works, and I just pray that you would be with him and, and alleviate the pain in his hip. Help him to find out what it is that's causing that and that there might be a remedy that, short of painkillers that would help him to deal with it. I pray that you would be with Don Seagraves. He's had a couple of seizures and he's dealing with a lot in his life and to have this happen on top of it. I just pray that that these seizures might be alleviated, that they might find out what it is that's causing it, and that it might be dealt with so that it might not, you might not have to deal with it in the future. Also pray that you would be with Tyler Quarter. That is hard. It's hard to go through these treatments and he's going through chemo and, and radiation. I just pray that that you would be with him and give him a give him a clean bill of health when he's come through it. Lord, we're, we're so thankful for everything that you do for us. We also pray that you would be with the Meeks family who are dealing with the death of a, of a fellow family member. Sometimes these deaths are, can be devastating to a family, and I just pray that you would lay your comforting hand on them and, and help them to deal with it. Lord, we're so thankful to you for everything you do for us. So often, I know in my own life, I, I forget all of the blessings that you give to us, to me especially. And I just pray that you would help us to look around and see the blessings in everyday life. Help us to reach out to others where we can and show them that this life is, is a wonderful life that you have given us. Lord, I just pray now that you would be with us. Vehicles who have been mentioned and we're so thankful for you, to you, for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that I pray these things this morning. Amen. So this morning as we um, prepare for our communion time, we're going to be singing Echo Holy. And this song talks about what is it going to look like when Jesus comes back to get us, to see us? Just a couple of the verses. Um, standing at the end of time, there before the throne of grace, majesty before my eyes, let it take my breath away. It talks about that the angels will all be there, and they'll be bowing down. They'll be worshiping the king. What's our chances? Are we going to be there? Are we going to see that? It's all up to us as individuals. Where we'll be.
extend as far as the eye can see. It is intriguing to see the land transition from muddy brown to springtime green to harvest gold. Huge combines make their slow passage through the fields in July and August, pouring tons of harvested grain into the beds of bleeding trucks as the rich fields are reduced again to brown stubble and mud. Few of us give much thought to where our food is produced or by whose hands and efforts it comes to our table. To us, a loaf of bread is just that. Although we know better, we tend to think of it only as, a, as in the completed form, whole sliced and whole and sliced form. 
One could almost imagine a great chugging piece of farm machinery slowly making its way through a vast field of plastic wrap loads of sliced sandwich bread. The reality, of course, is that our bread is produced by crushing thousands of crews a week into a fine powder that is transported, packaged, and brought home. Then the powder is scooped into a great mound waiting for addition of water and other ingredients. Then comes the kneading, forming, raising, baking, and finally, a loaf of fresh bread shared by a family around the table. The grain that makes up that finished bread came from hundreds of individ individual plants spread over great distances. Scattered kernels brought together in a single, into a single whole loaf. Near the beginning of the second century, an elder Christian writer composed a prayer to be used during the communion service. Although, although not part of the inspired scripture, the prayer is moving and gives us an intriguing glimpse into the worship of the first generation of believers after the passing of the apostles. And it goes like this. We thank you, our Father, for life and the knowledge that you have made known to us through your servant, Jesus. To, the, to, to you be glory forever. Just as this broken loaf, once gathered across the hills, was gathered together and became this one loaf, let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ forever. What an image. <clears throat> Scattered grain lifted from across the hills and brought together to form one loaf as a visible parable of the church of Christ being gathered from across faraway lands and far up times into a single gathered family of the kingdom of God at the end of the age. Paul gives the seed of this very thought when he observes, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. It is hard to see a loaf of it is hard to see the loaf of bread when standing in the middle of endless growing acres of grain. And it's also hard to, to picture the acres of grain when looking at a loaf of fresh bread baked. Yet in our hearts we both know the realities, the seen and the not yet not seen are true. We are coming around the table to give us the ability to see both gathered bread and scattered fields and to live in a certain hope that soon our harvester will be sent forth to bring us all home. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful that you allowed your son to come in a cruel and crazy world to save us as individuals, to give us hope that after this life, there's something far greater than what we have been part of here. My prayer would be for everyone sitting here this morning that we understand and know the only way to heaven is through your son. And may we focus, Lord, on the areas that we struggle in. Help us to do better, Lord. We need to do better. So we pray with you this day, in this time of communion, that we just stop and focus and call upon what you did for us when you gave your life on the cross. We pray that your name is one.
So this morning, uh, Floyd doesn't need any introductions, but um, for, for those of you that don't know Floyd, Floyd grew up in this church. So this is his home church, and he'll, he'll admit that, won't you, Floyd? Yeah. And it's just good to have him back to fill our pulpit and kids' absence, and I'm just looking forward to what Floyd has to say to us today through God's Word. Thanks, Terry. It is really good to be here. I just thank you for this opportunity that I have to come and, and present a message to you. This is my home church, <clears throat> and it's where I learned about Jesus and where I fell in love with Jesus. And, and that uh, road became a little rocky after I left here, but I came back and I uh, have followed Jesus closely for at least the last 17 years. And it's just a privilege to be able to come and share with you uh, and to bring a message that I hope will be uh, inspiring and that will bring you something that you can remember and take with you and use in your daily life. For those <coughs> that have heard me before, you know I use a lot of scripture. I do this because I know God can say things in a much more powerful way than I can. Today I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, and I'll begin by reading Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 11. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the spiritual nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's law, and it never will. That is why those who are still under the, their control of the sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember, those that, who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not do belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by the dictates, you will die. But if you, through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. Let me pray. Dear God, I just ask you to be with me as I deliver this message that you've given to me. I just ask that you would open our hearts and minds to hear your word and to use it and to go forth from here and be witnesses for you and to live under the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. I've entitled my message, The Ministry of the Holy Spirit. I believe that the most misunderstood member of the triune God is the Holy Spirit. This may be due to his status as a spirit, a state we find less concrete and understandable than Father or Son. In the church today, there is a broad ignorance or a lack of knowledge about what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit and the importance of the work of the Holy Spirit. But be assured, there is no shortage of biblical data about the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is mentioned over 100 times in the Old Testament and more than 250 times in the New Testament. It seems to me that a number of churches are scared of the Holy Spirit or they are overly cautious about teaching about the Holy Spirit. 
The result of that is that the Holy Spirit winds up on the back shelf or almost forgotten entirely. A.W. Tozer, an American pastor and author, said this about the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. I am happy today because I believe that you are a New Testament church. I looked on your website and under this section, what we believe, I read this. We believe that the Holy Spirit dwells with, in all who accept God's terms of salvation. The Spirit begins the work of transforming Christians into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We see the product of that transformation in the fruit we bear. In the time I have today, I simply want to reinforce what you believe about the Holy Spirit, what he does, and the importance of the Holy Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament came upon individuals in power to accomplish tasks and purposes. Kit has been preaching on Daniel, and in chapter 5, on which Kit preached last week, we learn that King Belshazzar's mother recognized that Daniel had the Spirit of the Holy God. The Holy Spirit's role changed significantly in the New Testament. The ministry in the the Holy Spirit's ministry in the Old Testament was primarily task driven. In the New Testament and today, his ministry is people driven. Scripture describes the Holy Spirit in personal terms, not as an impersonal force. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit teaches, guides, comforts, and intercedes for us. Or a Tory, an evangelist in the late 1800s and early 1900s said this, if we think of the Holy Spirit only as an impersonal power or influence, then our thoughts will constantly be, how can I get hold of and use the Holy Spirit? But if we think of him in the biblical way as a divine person, infinitely wise, infinitely holy, infinitely tender, our thoughts will constantly be, how can the Holy Spirit get hold of and use me. It is the indwelling Holy Spirit working in and through you that empowers you to live out a Christian life. The Holy Spirit came on the disciples on the day of Pentecost as described in Acts chapter 2. The first thing it must do is determine how we receive this, this same Holy Spirit. In my review of scripture, I have found only one place where it tells us what we must do to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. He finishes his sermon in verse 36. I will read verses 36 through 38. So everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In my training as a lawyer, I learned that when something is as clear as this, you do not try to interpret it, or add to it or subtract from it. The scripture is clear that to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, there must be repentance and baptism. Once we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, there are many ways that he works in our lives, but they all share one common goal, to make us more like Jesus. The Holy Spirit gives us, as believers, the power to live like Jesus. Let me talk about a few ways the Holy Spirit does this. First, the Holy Spirit gives us power to witness. In Acts 1, verse 8, Jesus says, You will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, 
and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit gives us this boldness to testify about Jesus in situations where we would normally be fearful or timid. 2 Timothy 1.7 confirms this by telling us that God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. Remember that witnessing is not just something a Christian says, but it, what a Christian is. Witnessing is sharing Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit in words and actions and leaving the results to God. The Holy Spirit also guides us into all truth. Jesus in John 16, 13 said, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. You need to understand and believe that God is absolute truth. His truth does not depend on a set of circumstances. His truth is true for all people everywhere all the time. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus also said in John 8, 31 and 32, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can know the truth, and he will guide us in the direction we need to go. I like the way Dr. Charles Stanley put it when he said, earthly wisdom is doing what comes naturally. Godly wisdom is doing what the Holy Spirit compels us to do. The Holy Spirit is our leader, and those who follow him are his sons and daughters. This is reinforced in Romans 8, 14 through 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we will also share his suffering. Another thing the Holy Spirit does is convict us of sin. I wish I didn't have to say this, but we all sin. Romans 3.23 reminds us of this where we read, For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. When the Holy Spirit convicts us we have, uh, that we have sinned, we need to immediately confess that sin to God and repent of it. In 1 John 1, 9, it assures us that if we do this, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin when it happens, but also before it happens. He will start to tap on your heart once temptation occurs. We need to listen to him and resist temptation. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit would teach us to be ruthless in avoiding anything that would lead us to sin. One of the most important things the Holy Spirit does is reveal God's word to us. In John 14, 26, Jesus tells us that when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything I have told you. Listen to what Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16. This is such a beautiful passage. We have received God's Spirit, not the world's Spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit. You, 
using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truth. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit will open God's word to us. It has been said that reading the Bible without the Holy Spirit is like using a sundial in moonlight on a cloudy night. Another author wrote, you might as well try to hear without ears or breathe without lungs as try and live a Christian life without the Holy Spirit in your heart. I am firmly convinced that the one who has the Holy Spirit in their heart and the scripture in their hands has all they need. I think one of the most powerful and beautiful things the Holy Spirit does for us is that he prays for us. I'm sure that this is a familiar passage to you, uh, Romans 8, 26 and 27. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who lists, knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Another quote I like from Charles Stanley, who died earlier this year, as I think you probably know. When thinking about prayer is this. The Holy Spirit power cannot be harnessed. This power cannot be used to accomplish anything other than the Father's will. He is not a candy dispenser. He is not a vending machine. He is not a genie waiting for someone to rub his lamp the right way. He is holy God. Have you ever been praying long and hard but did not feel that your words mattered? You felt like your prayers were not being heard or answered? Remember that that time with the Lord is not wasted. It sustains your relationship with him. When you are yielded and obedient to the Lord, the Holy Spirit guides you and provides the wisdom you need in order to pray according to his will. I believe that mature faith does not live by answers to prayer, but by prayer. Let me assure you, as his word does, that God is listening attentively to your cries, and the Holy Spirit is your constant companion living within you. If you are tempted to give up on unanswered prayer, remember that the Holy Spirit is there to teach you all things and even to intercede when you do not know how to pray. So far, I have talked about how the Holy Spirit transforms our lives by giving us boldness to witness, by guiding us into all truth, by convicting us of sin, by revealing God's word to us, and by praying for us. There are many other ways that the Holy Spirit transforms our lives, but we simply don't have the time to explore all of those today. The bottom line is that the Holy Spirit gives us power to live like Jesus. Let me close by looking at what this looks like in the life of a Christian. In Galatians 5, 22 through 25, we read, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. 
One of the most difficult things we have to learn is that we do not produce this fruit. These are spirit-produced fruit, which indicates beauty, spontaneity, quietness, and growth, instead of effort, labor, strain, and toil. When we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us, it produces a life pleasing to God, which human effort cannot do. When the Holy Spirit is in charge of our lives, he does through us that which we cannot do for ourselves. Let's look briefly at each one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love. Only the Spirit of God can produce in us love for those who hate us and give us the strength and ability to love like God. Joy. Joy produced by the Holy Spirit does not depend on circumstances. The joy produced by the Holy Spirit gives me settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life and the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. Peace. The Holy Spirit gives us peace with God, which creates internal well-being. Peace that spills into our relationships with others, so we become peacemakers. Patience. The patience that comes from the Spirit gives us the ability to forgive other people and the, the ability to endure even in unfavorable circumstances. It also gives us the ability to wait on God. Kindness. The kindness produced by the Holy Spirit connotes generosity, a given spirit that reflects how God treats us. Goodness. The fruit of goodness from the Holy Spirit produces only what is good and right and true, which we cannot do without the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. Faithfulness. Faithfulness produced by the Holy Spirit allows us to exercise good faith and fidelity in our, in our relationship, just as God does with us. Gentleness. The fruit of gentleness, gentleness from the Holy Spirit is the complete opposite of the fruit of the flesh found in verse 20, which is idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of angers, selfish ambition, dissensions, and division. If we are not walking in the Spirit, we are walking in the flesh, controlled by our sinful nature, and will, we will produce fruits of the flesh. Self-control, the final fruit mentioned, empowers us through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit to avoid sin. The key to doing that is found in verse 24 and 25. Let me read those verses again as they are important. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. The question each of us must answer is, are we living in the Spirit with the Spirit's power, or are we living in and walking in the flesh? Remember what John said in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. We need to do God's will, but I'm afraid that too many of us go around trying to produce God's will produce love, joy, peace, and other fruit through our own effort. That simply will not work. Victory comes through surrender, not self-effort. We can't let uh, walk in the flesh. We need to walk in the spirit. And so, again, I remind you of John, 1 John 2.15. Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for ev everything we see, and a pride in our own achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world, and this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does not who, who does what pleases God will live forever. You know, I think that we 
need to surrender to Jesus. And the, the victory comes through that surrender. And I think that's what Paul was saying in Galatians 2.20 when he said, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is my prayer for you today, that you would walk in the Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to produce good fruit in your life. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, verses 17 through 20. A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. So, it just is so important that we follow what Jesus has taught us about the Holy Spirit. I just want to close with one story. Um, a former uh, Yellowstone Park Ranger tells us a story of a park ranger that was leading a group of hikers on a hike to a lookout tower. And that ranger thought that the noise from his uh, walkie-talkie was distracting, so he turned it off. He wanted to tell the people, the hikers, about the flowers and the animals that existed. So he turned it off and he continued on the way. And as he neared the lookout tower, here comes a, a lookout running down to him and, and all excited. And he says to him, Why did you turn off, or why did you not answer your radio? And the guy looked at him and said, why? He said, well, we've been trying to get a hold of you to warn you that a grizzly bear has been seen stalking your uh, group. And the message for us is that we cannot tune out and turn off the message that God sends us through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guides us. The Holy Spirit teaches us. And we need to understand that we have to live under that power and under that strength that we receive from the Holy Spirit. So let me just say that we're not going to have an invitation today as such, but I just want to tell you that if there's anyone here that does not have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, Scripture is clear as how you can have that. Scripture tells you that you need to repent and turn to God and be obedient to Christian baptism, and then you will receive the Holy Spirit. You've seen today what all the Holy Spirit can do for you, so if you haven't accepted that, I just pray that you would, that you would come and talk to your elders, talk to Kit. If you'd like, you can talk to me. But it's just so important. And you that have the Holy Spirit living in you, let it live and, and do what it does. Don't let the flesh try to over out or crowd out the Holy Spirit that's living within you. It, it's just that important that you let that Holy Spirit live and do its thing inside of you to produce the fruit that you can't produce on your own, but the Holy Spirit can produce that fruit in your life. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we just thank you for this opportunity to come and, and listen to your word. We just thank you that we have the ability with the indwelling presence, presence of the Holy Spirit to understand your word and to live by it. Lord, just help each one of us live each day by your word. 
Help each one of us. Let the Holy Spirit make us more like Jesus each and every day. Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity to be here today and to bring this message. I just pray that this message will have touched someone, that the word, your word, will have touched someone to either accept your, your call to have the Holy Spirit within them, or that your word would help each one that's here today and remind them of the power and strength that the Holy Spirit can give them. I just thank you, and I ask you to bless all these people for asking Christ on the name. Amen. Amen. You can be dismissed, is what Terry has told me to tell you. So thank you very much. Thank you.